Hello. All right, then. Let's get on with it. It's a brand new episode of the Fun Kids Science Weekly, the greatest podcast in the history of the universe. Fact. I've got the award and everything to prove it. My name's Dan. Thank you for listening. This week, we're learning about one of the rarest and most strangely dangerous creatures in the world. Also, you can hear how the Mars helicopter is getting on, and I've got your questions. This week, they're on squid, snow, and shocks. That's coming up in just a sec. Before then, let's check in with our alien mates. This is NNG. NNG's Energy Challenge. I mean, say what you like about Earthlings. I say they live on a rubbish planet too far away from Zog, and we're never going to get home. For goodness (laughs) sake, don't be so dramatic. I was going to say, well, say what you like, but they sure do have cosy homes with lots of interesting gadgets. Look, come over here, quick. Why? Is there a fire? Emergency? Emergency? No, I've just been fiddling with this computer thingy. And look, it has a portal onto their internet thingamajig that might just help us out. I think we need a bit more help than a silly net. What do you think we can do with that? Play a football? I mean the internet. Look, a portal of information. All about energy. Welcome to electquizzery.com. Find out more about energy on Earth and post your questions for the Quizler. Wow! How many different ways are there to make the energy we use in our homes? Most homes use gas and electricity. Gas comes from fossil fuels under the ground. Electricity can be made from a wide variety of fuels, including gas, but also nuclear and renewable sources such as solar and wind power. These renewable varieties can be kinder to the environment than those that are made from fossil fuels. Yes, uh, all very well having all those types of energy, but none of them are good enough to get us home. Rubbish! And did you know, even rubbish can be used as a fuel to make the electricity to power and heat our homes. It's called biofuel. Well, I don't see why they need so many different types. Look, like she said, even in this funny little homes, they use two different types, gas and electricity. Why have both? That's just greedy. Well, it's because different gadgets and thingamajogs use different types. Like the washing machine and the toasty burner. You mean the washing machine and the toaster. They both use electricity. And the cosy wells and the splashy tub. You mean heating and hot water? They're often run on gas. Homes don't have to have both types, but most do, according to this website. Gosh, there's so many questions for the Quizler. Let's take a look. These are, look! Mm, look at all the questions. Where does the electricity go when there's a power cut? What's the biggest lightning bolt on record? How much electricity does the world use every day? I have a hunch that this is going to give us the answer to get back to Zog. <laughs> hey, maybe this planet isn't so rubbish after all. Watch out! Looks like we're gonna fuse, G! Here it comes! Whoopee! I love a bit of fusion! Here it comes! Woohoo! NNG's Energy Challenge with support from National Grid. Find out more online at funkitslive.com slash energy. It's question time on the show. The most easy, the most amazing, my favourite part of the show. It's so simple. You send over your science questions to me. Leave them as a review over on Apple Podcasts. Find us on there. Uh, Drop it in the little comment box at the bottom. I'll see your question. I'll do the dig in and we'll get it sorted. This one is from Finley, who wants to know, how do giant squid see in the pitch black? right at the bottom of the ocean where almost no light can get anywhere near it it's so dark now squid have light organs little things called photophores and they use them like headlights on a car they're near their eyes and they shine a tiny little bit of light out there to help it see in the dark now that's how the squid cope deep down but fish can see deep in the ocean because they've evolved brilliant eyes These eyes are highly sensitive and they can see tiny bits of colour, little specks of light. They can see that way better than we can. Uh, Creatures that are deep down there in the ocean, we need to do more digging about these things because they are uh, just mind blowing. Thank you for the question, Finley. This one is from Critical Maths, uh, who wants to know, how come water is clear, but snow is white? I'd never thought about that really before. It's true, isn't it? Rain is clear, pretty much see-through, sometimes a little bit murky green, but mostly see-through. But snow is white. It's because when water freezes and becomes ice, 
it forms hard ice crystals. Now, when light, which is how we see everything, when that light hits the crystals, it bounces off, it reflects, and we get the whole spectrum of colour. Now, when you see every colour and put them together, you get white. You get a white light, which is why when the light hits the ice, you see white snow. Thank you very much, Critical Maths. Uh, And lastly today, Mercy and Minnow want to know, why don't birds get an electric shock when they sit on power lines? It's because electric current, electricity, it takes the shortest possible journey to uh, get back to Earth, to complete its trip, to make the surface. That's what it does. Now, if you think of a power line, the electricity that's running down those lines, it gets to the ground eventually. Now, it doesn't electrocute the bird because it's an added bit of the journey. It will take it a little bit longer. Travelling through the bird that is perched there would make the journey go much slower. Uh, It would slow it down and it's just quicker to not bother at all. Now, if that bird was connected to the earth another way, if it had one really long leg or something, I don't know how that would work, but if it was, uh, then it would get electrocuted because the electric current would find a quicker path through the bird of getting back to earth. Uh, It's amazing stuff. Thank you very much, Mercy and Minnow, for the questions. If you've got something that you want answered, you need to leave it as a review for me over on Apple Podcasts. Now, we're looking at the future of the world this week, and with us now is Dale Vince. He's the owner of the green energy company Ecotricity, also the owner of uh, Forest Green Rovers, who are in League Two. Dale, thank you for being there. Uh, Great pleasure to be here. Now, um, the idea of saving the planet, it's all over the place at the moment. Uh, But you've been doing this for quite a while now. What was the moment that made you realize, hang on, I need to sit up, something needs to be done? Well, when I was a kid, actually, I was probably about 11 years old and I was uh, going home from school and looking at the cars on the road and thinking there's quite a lot of them and they all hold a lot of fuel. And I wondered where it came from and when it was going to run out. And nobody was talking about that. And it bothered me because I knew it had to run out. Everything runs out. Um, So that was my first thought. And then I carried that with me into later life. And it was probably 30 years ago that I... um, Drop back in from a life living on the road, living in buses and trucks and things like that. Drop back in and try to build a big windmill to tackle the climate crisis. Now, before the big windmill, though, when you were still, I guess, young enough to be doing like little projects where you're not building massive windmills on hills and stuff like that. Uh, what kind of small things were you doing, maybe at home, maybe when you were on the buses uh, that, that were just helping you become self-sufficient and self-sustainable? I guess living on the road, it would have been using a little windmill. I had one on the roof of my trailer. I had some old train batteries that I got from a scrapyard. And it was towards the end of my 10 years living on the road that I moved from candle power to light my evenings to uh, electric lights powered by the wind. Uh, And then you find yourself in charge of owning uh, Forest Green Rovers. I'll lay my cards on the table, Dale. I'm a Wickham Wanderers fan who are in the championship. So, uh, but um, I've lived near, uh, lived in Cheltenham for a little bit. So I kind of know the area very well. Um, So I love Forest Green. I love everything about them. And what's the first thing you do when you you come in to to save the football club pretty much? Um, but their ethos isn't lined up with how you uh, see the world. You know, it's going to be a long project to make this, you know, the the world's first carbon neutral club. But what's the first thing that you do? Um, I took red meat off the menu is the first thing that I actually did. And and I kind of didn't go into it with any kind of plan. I just rescued the club and then just bumped into the fact on day one that there was an awful lot going on at the club that didn't sit with my principles. But the first thing I bumped into almost literally was a beef lasagna being fed to our players. And I said to the chef and the coach at the time, you know, we just have to stop this. And that's what we did. Now, people listening might not really know the difference between how I guess beef and red meat and and other animal products how that affects our health compared to stuff that is made through plants can you just talk us through that how a vegan diet can affect our uh, our health and maybe actually make us better on the pitch yeah, I mean, there, there are two main aspects, I think. I mean, firstly, there's the environment. Beef is, uh, you know, one of the biggest drivers of the climate crisis. Animal agriculture itself, farming animals for food, is like second biggest cause of, of the climate crisis. So there's an inherent problem in that food choice. But as you say, it's also 
better for us not to eat animals. Uh, you know, animal products are linked to all kinds of human diseases. That's become apparent in the last 20 years, probably. And in our particular case in football, what we find is that a plant-based diet gives our players more energy. They recover faster after a game and they have less soft tissue injuries. And this has become a common theme across all elite sports now. You'll see uh, Formula One, Lewis Hamilton is vegan. You'll see in heavyweight boxing, in tennis, in rugby, even in American football, there's a whole team of players that have gone vegan and it's because of the benefits to human health and performance it's not just changes on the menu that you've you've implemented uh, since you've been there the forest green have risen from uh, what was the conference uh, to league two now you're pushing to get to league one uh, how how linked do you think it is that you've got vegan players who you believe to be fitter who are fitter than other people um and and how well you're doing on the pitch well, we've definitely seen it have an impact. When we got promoted to League Two, we did it via Wembley. We played a, a final match um, after a long season of about 50 games, and we had no injuries in our squad at all, which is quite exceptional. Yeah. And the team we played, Tranmere, had like six or seven, and obviously it impacted the strength on the day, and we beat them 3-1 and got promoted. So that's my best example. <laughs> so it starts with the plant-based diet. What else have you done at the club, Dale? What other projects have you uh, taken on at Forest Green that has made you, as I say, the first carbon neutral football club? There's a range of things, but what I would say to your listeners is that really there are only three topic or three areas to think about. It's energy, transport, and food. It's how we power ourselves, it's how we travel, and it's what we eat. So at the club, we've got solar panels on the roof of our stadium, so we make our own electricity. That's zero carbon. Uh, we have electric charging points for cars, and we have electric vehicles for the kit man, for example. These are zero emission vehicles. And of course, we have a vegan uh, menu for players, staff, and for fans. And in between all of that, we've got an organic pitch. We've got a little solar-powered robot lawnmower that trundles around the pitch 24-7, just does its own thing. It plugs itself in when its batteries run low, and it helps us uh, keep the grass cut without having a big impact on it, you know, from a heavy machine. It's a very small machine. So we've got a lot of uh, things. Some of them are quite fun and quirky, um, but the big three things are energy, transport and food. And you're building a, a timber stadium. Yeah, it's going to be all made of wood. And the reason for that is we wanted the lowest carbon footprint stadium that we could have. And it turns out that 75% of the carbon footprint of any sports stadium in its entire lifetime, which could be 50 years, is baked in on day one. It's in the materials that it's made from, concrete and steel. So by not having those, by using wood, we will have the lowest carbon footprint stadium in the world since the Romans invented concrete. Now, you've touched on this already with the three things that you just listed a second ago, but football does get a little bit of a bad rap for how damaging, I guess, um, that it can be for the environment. Uh, teams travelling all around the world to play games, that kind of stuff. World Cups being set in Qatar. Uh, especially as football is in a position to be an example. I, I guess for you, what more needs to be done across football as a whole to, mil to, to meet goals of being uh, sustainable and carbon neutral? I think the world of football, like the world of business and the world of other sport, just need to take responsibility for their own environment impact, focus on the big issues of energy, transport and food. Don't worry about the things that you can't control today, like the need to fly to a foreign match or something like that, because actually electric planes are coming. Ten years from now, it'll be possible to fly across Europe in an electric plane. No problem. So don't worry about what you can't deal with today. There's plenty to get on with. Now, you're an ideas man. I think. Uh, how far down the line are you thinking in terms of ideas and projects that maybe you and Ecotricity and, and Forest Green can get involved in? I don't really know how to answer that. I just come up with ideas uh, and then we pursue them uh, or we see problems and we look for a different way to do things and then we pursue that. Uh, it's not about looking deeply into the future for me. Um, I guess the ultimate goal is for us to get to being zero carbon as a country. Uh, to give an awful lot of our land back to nature, which we can do if we stop eating animals. 50% of our whole country we can give back to wildlife. I would love to see that happen. For our transport to be electric, for our air to be clean, and our energy to come from wind and sun. I mean, that would be a great world to be in. And, and I don't know when that will happen, but that's what I pursue. Um, you mentioned zero carbon then. We, we've spoken around it. Can you just very quickly define it for us, for, the, for those who maybe don't know what it actually means? 
Yeah, it's about cutting our carbon emissions. Uh, this is the carbon dioxide that we release into the atmosphere. And we've got to get that down to zero. Um, our government have set a target by 2050, which is 30 years from now. Uh, the science says, actually, we've got to do better than that. And we've got about 10 years to make drastic changes. And what's driving carbon emissions are two things, the burning of fossil fuels to make energy and power vehicles, and the intensive farming of animals for food. If we can stop those two things, uh, then we take the biggest step. We're almost almost there to zero carbon. Um, and there'll be some things that we can't deal with that are very difficult. And for that, we can absorb carbon by rewilding, by giving land back to nature. What what strikes me as amazing, Dale, is, is humans. We seem to be pretty much the only species that has to rely on uh, other forms of energy that weren't here when the world started, uh, the sun and the wind and the oceans. If, um, if, if humans, if we were to switch to completely green energy, uh, I, I guess a question that might worry some people is, is, is there enough? Oh, yeah. Well, I like that question because the answer is, oh my God, yes, there is more than enough. I mean, we have enough wind energy just on shore in Britain to power the country four times over. We've probably got twice as much again offshore. We've got enough solar power to power ourselves eight times over. This is just Britain. But yeah, we could power ourselves completely many times over. And one of the wonderful things about renewable energy, the wind and the sun, is that they are available to every country in the world, where fossil fuels at the moment, they are not. They're concentrated in certain geographies. We fight wars over them. Um, you know, they're, they're increasingly rare and expensive. Everybody has access to the wind and the sun, so it, it could be a great democratizing thing for the world to switch to renewable energy. Uh, I've got one last question in just a sec. Very quickly, let me sneak this one in, and um, I'm going to throw you an idea. Now, you're a lot better at this than I am, so if it works, take it. I don't need credit. It's all right. I, <laughs> And I think I know the answer. I think the answer is probably storage, but... Why can't we just line all of the motorways around the country with solar panels? Uh, well, we could. It probably isn't the best way to deploy solar. So look, we have enough land in Britain that's not being used for food production to make enough solar energy to power the whole country eight times over. We're not short of land. Um, the motorways, they won't always be facing in the right direction and long lines of panels won't be as efficient as grouping them in fields. And, and yes, then there's a grid connection issue, maintenance as well. I mean, who wants to go along the motorway to clean solar panels? Not me. No, no, I don't either, to be honest. All right, I'll stick that one back on the uh, on the drawing board. Well, lastly, listen, I mean, you do big projects all around the world, um, uh, but you, uh, to save the world as well. Uh, but we can't all own a football club. We don't. We don't all have that that uh, that possibility. So, what are things that we can do at home right now? I know you mentioned the three things, but you know, people listening might not have a say in who gives the, the, their home their energy. So, what can we do right now to try and make a difference? Yeah, I get what you're saying. Look, if we're talking kids, then the biggest thing you can do is change what you eat. Lobby your parents uh, to give you food without animals in. It's the biggest change you can make. It'll make you better and healthier, and it's the biggest difference you can make to the environment. Are forest green going up this year? Well, if you'd have asked me that a couple of <laughs> no. weeks ago, I'd have said, yeah, it's looking good, but it's not looking so good now. Uh, Dale, listen, thank you so much for joining us. Now, this week's Dangerous Dan is about one of the rarest, weirdest creatures in the world. The duck-billed platypus is in Australia, and it looks bizarre, like a beaver found a duck's beak and feet and stuck them on. Now, when they were first discovered, they looked so strange that the scientists who found them thought they were fake. Now, it's not the only remarkable thing about how it looks, the duck uh, beak and feet. It's got ankle spurs as well which are little things that stick out and they're venomous. Now, it's not lethal, not officially deadly, but very toxic. It's one of the few venomous mammals on the planet, and they say the pain is excruciating. If it pricks you, it can send the venom all over, causing such intense hurt right the way through your body. Now, only the males have these spurs and can be venomous. But if I were you, if I saw one, I wouldn't stop to check. I would run away before the duck-billed platypus's ankles got anywhere near me. We're looking up into the sky now, looking at the weather that's all around us as we get through spring here in the UK. Might be a completely different season where you are, which is amazing. Let's find out more with Marina Ventura. Marina Ventura's Climate Explorers. Hi there, Marina Ventura here. 
I love finding out about the natural world, and that includes the Earth's climate. We know that weather can change from one day to the next, but climates can change too, over the time span of years, centuries, or even longer. So, I'm on a mission to fill MapApp with the latest climate information with the help of some awesome climate explorers. Come on then, let's go! Earth is very old, four and a half billion years old in fact. It can be really hard to get your head around such a big number, especially as humans have only been around for a tiny amount of that time. That said, I bet you know a bit about how life on Earth has changed. Here's a clue. You know about dinosaurs, right? Luckily, we don't need to worry about them anymore. Well, just as types of life on Earth have changed over time, so has the global climate. Come on, let's find out what's behind those changes. You've already hit on one thing behind changes, Marina. Types of life can affect the climate. When the Earth was very young, even though there wasn't as much heat coming from the sun, the planet was very hot and gassy. And that's because there weren't any plants to absorb these gases. These gases acted a bit like a blanket and stopped the heat escaping, so air temperatures went up. As life on Earth developed, plants evolved and grew in number. As they were able to absorb gases like carbon dioxide, they helped reduce the blanket effect and cooled temperatures down. And temperatures cooled down. For the last few million years, the sun has been causing climates to change. Stars like the sun get hotter as they age, and today the Earth gets more heat from the sun than it did when life was starting to develop on our planet. And the sun itself is always changing. Giant dark spots called sunspots are always moving across its surface, causing the sun to give off slightly more energy, which makes the Earth a bit warmer. So what else makes climates naturally change? Well, something else that comes in cycles is all to do with the Earth's orbit, the way it moves around the sun. The shape of the orbit changes gradually from a circle to more of an oval in a cycle that lasts about a hundred thousand years. This makes the Earth move further away from the Sun at times, so less of the Sun's energy reaches the planet. The Earth also tilts as it orbits, and that tilt can be bigger at some times than others. This means that parts of the Earth become closer to the Sun, and so hotter in summer, and others are further away, and so colder in winter. So naturally there will be cycles of different climates as the Earth's orbit changes and as the energy the planet gets from the Sun varies, as well as what kind of plants and animals are living. These are all reasons why the climate has naturally changed and will continue to do so. But don't forget there are things which can affect climates which aren't related to our orbit of the Sun. Remember the dinosaurs! Good point, Mappy. You'll probably know that scientists believe the dinosaurs died out because a giant meteorite crashed into the Earth. The meteorite caused a dust cloud which blocked out the sun, causing temperatures to drop. Many living things on Earth died. Something similar happens when volcanoes erupt. Clouds of ash can fill the skies, sometimes for many years, blocking out sunlight and causing global temperatures to drop. Scientists have noticed that in the last hundred years or so, the climate has changed in other unexpected ways. Whilst we are in the middle of a naturally warmer part of the cycle, temperatures have risen much more quickly than they have before. This is because of the effect that humans have on the environment, and it's something we'll be finding out more about. That's right. All with the help of some real-life climate explorers. Come on, Marina. Load me up. Good job, Mappy. See you soon, everyone. Marina Ventura's Climate Explorers, supported by the Natural Environment Research Council, the science of the natural world. Find out more at funkidslive.com slash marina. It's time for this week's Science in the News. A small green rock that's been pulled out of the ocean could show us our future. It was found near Antarctica, and experts say that it shouldn't be there, that it should be almost 1,000 miles away. They think that it travelled there because it was part of a huge ice sheet that melted millions of years ago, and it floated there, and they're going to use this rock to study what might happen if the current ice caps melt away. Uh, Also, the Mars helicopter has taken a picture of the Mars rover. It was taken during the helicopter's third flight, which it saw it fly uh, five metres in the sky. It went on its bravest mission yet. It flew 100 metres in just over one minute. 
Uh, and finally, the US Dragon spaceship from the SpaceX rocket has docked in the International Space Station. Americans Shane Kimbra, Megan MacArthur, Frenchman Thomas Pesquet, and Japanese flyer Akihiko Hoshidi uh, were greeted by hugs from the crew already on board. And that is it for this week's Fun Kids Science Weekly. Thank you so much for listening. If you've got something science that you want answered on the show, you need to leave it as a review for me over on Apple Podcasts. Now, wherever you listen to the show, make sure you follow us on Google, uh, on Spotify, on Apple, wherever it is. Find us there every week. You can also have a listen on the free Fun Kids app and at funkidslive.com. And Fun Kids are a children's radio station from the UK. Listen to us all around the country on that DAB digital radio, on the free Fun Kids mobile app, and at funkidslive.com 